Hi, good morning. Welcome to Crosspoint this morning. We're starting off a little different. Stage looks a little different, and we have some special things planned. Uh, we just finished a good week of Vacation Bible School, and so we'd like to start this morning with celebrating that. We've got a video to show with some pictures, and we are going to enjoy some VBS music for our worship this morning, and then hear from the kids a little bit about some highlights from the week. Um, so kiddos, we'll be, you can come up, I'll be reminding you to come up right after our video plays, okay? So after we get done watching the pictures, you guys can make your way up to the floor area here. And if Olivia Dunbar or Kiara Falmer are here, please find me in just a minute. I see one. Okay, good. So kiddos, I'll see you in a minute and um, enjoy the picture show. was all but gone a second chance to sing a brand new song you opened up my eyes to see you rescued me rescued me you showed the way when there was no way out cleared up my mind when you It was quite a production. Okay, so kids, uh, you're coming on up to stage. So any kids who are here during VBS, come on up. We want to invite you guys to stand up with us and worship too. We're going to be showing motions on the screen and hopefully you can get a spot to enjoy and enjoy seeing your little kiddos up here too.
for saving me. Thank you, God, for saving me. Rescue from the middle of the ocean deep. Rescue from the middle of the ocean deep. You set my feet on solid ground. You set my feet on solid ground. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Everything I have, I owe it all to you. For everything you are and all you do, Lord, I could write a book, fill every single page with a million reasons to thank you. You 
loves me and he loved me first He rescued me when I was in a lurch And I won't worry, worry about a thing and to the left I'll fly sit down. This is how we roll. No shoes all week. Come on. Come on. Come sit down. I got to talk to the grown-ups for a minute, you know. You know how that goes. Okay, so VBS. Yeah. It was awesome. We averaged about 100 kids a night, which is amazing. We saw a lot of new faces. Um, throughout the week, and we saw a lot of familiar faces, and we love both. So we want to thank you guys for bringing your kids every night. Um, we know that that can be kind of daunting. Get home from work, get them out the door, bring the kids. Um, we want to thank all of you guys for all your donations. That was amazing. We could not have done it without all the donations that you guys provided. And also for praying for us. <laughs> Frankly, every night, we need that. We need the prayer, prayer, so we thank you guys for that, too. Um, we have lots of people to thank. We need to thank our registration team, our decorating team. I mean, did you guys see the decorations? Just saying. Our food team, who fed you guys every night. Our games team, I think you guys liked those. Our drama team, which gets the story uh, across every night in a great way. Our preschool team, just say thank you very much for everything you did. And our crew leaders, our crew leaders, you guys stepped up to do amazing stuff this week. Not just come every night, but to really invest in the kids each night, to build relationships. That's what it's all about. You guys were amazing, and we're so thankful for you. All of our floater people who just came and said, hey, what do you need me to do tonight? I'm there. We had a lot of people like that, and I want to say, especially the youth. The youth of Crosspoint really stepped up. Um, 
it was amazing. We couldn't have done it without you guys. And we are very thankful for your heart of service to the church. Uh, our worship team, you guys who helped all the kids learn the dances and the moves. I know the Zares aren't here today, but you guys did a great job of getting the kids motivated and um, into worship. Our video team who created the videos each night, took pictures each night. Um, I want to thank Van. Van! How long have we been at this now, Van? This is our fifth year together, I think. Our fifth year. I can't put into words, I really can't, what Van does for this VBS. For me, I could not do what I do at all without Van. He keeps me on time. Um, he makes me look good. <laughs> you know, he comes in with creative ideas that just blow my mind. And I'll tell you, I came in probably an hour to an hour and a half early every night, and Van was already here working. Um, he helps create sets on the fly. I mean, he's amazing. Thanks, Mr. Van. We love you. Yeah, clap for him, man. I also want to thank my partner in crime, Mr. Jim, a.k.a. Ben Brucker, um, for just being so fun. He's great at physical comedy. I don't know where you are. Yes. Thank you so much. He took water to the face. He fell down. I mean, lots of stuff. And it makes, really, it makes for a very fun VBS. So thank you for being my sidekick for year two for that. My monkey handler out there who handled my monkey, Mr. Dan. Um, all who came early to set up, and everyone who stayed late to tear down. We just really appreciate everything that you guys did. We couldn't do it without you, Gina, for feeding us, for feeding the volunteer team, and for feeding the families who came for family night. Thank you so much just for being that, taking care of us, for taking care of us. Um, I also want to thank Big Daddy Mark. I don't know where you are, Big Daddy Mark. G Money and Easty Beastie, where are you guys? I put out the call for a rapper earlier um, this month, and he took that call. So, and he didn't just take it. He, he took it. He really sold it. So we were very, it, it just got the kids really into it. We're really excited. So thank you for willing to, you know, kind of make crazy of yourself. So, so I know I forgot people, and I'm sorry about that. Thank you. I love it. I love it. I love seeing all these faces all the time and them getting excited and getting them to, to see how they see God. It's just amazing. So what, what I just wanted to say quickly is VBS is not just VBS. I mean, you might just think, oh, it's a week in the summer. It's just VBS. It's really not. There's lots of families here who started coming to Crosspoint because of VBS. Um, I know in my own personal life, some of our very best friends in the world uh, started coming to Crosspoint, and we call them family now, because our son invited their daughter when they were five, eight years ago, happy birthday, JJ, eight years ago, um, to VBS. And now their daughter was a crew leader this year. So it's just amazing to see how, how it all comes full circle. Um, you know, kids who invite kids. So the kids, I had a kid ask me, and this is kind of what VBS is about too, during the crafts, he said, why did Jesus go with the guards? Do you guys remember that story? Jesus went with the guards. And this kiddo asked me, why did he go? And I thought, this is why we do this. We could have a conversation right there and then about why Jesus did what he did. And that's why we do this every year. And, and this too. All of it. So let's talk about Operation Christmas Child really quick. That was our mission project, right? And what did I tell you guys? We set the bar high, 400 items, didn't we, Deva? 400. What'd we get? 670. We got 670. Yeah. Yeah. That is pretty awesome. So we started this weird, terrible tradition at Crosspoint where I will do and I will rope other people into doing something crazy if we meet our goal. And this year I said, and I roped Ben into it without really asking, I said we need a bug. Because we were on a deserted island, it made sense. Last year we got slimed, Anna and I. So I said that, and what did I do? You ate a bug. I ate a bug. And they picked the grossest bug out of the three choices. 
of course, the mealworm. Yeah, oh yeah, it was just, just what you think it was. It was gross, it was gross. But I will do it for you guys because I knew you would bring all that stuff if I did it. So I did it and it didn't go well for me, but that's okay. I would do it again. I would do it again in a second. So I want to ask you guys, what was your very favorite part of VBS this year? Painting. I think he said everything. I'm not sure. Singing. Singing. Snacks. Yeah. Games. Crafts. Um, bugs. bugs. <laughs> um, bugs. Bugs. You realize this is going to be hard to top next year. Uh, games. games. Uh, Grace Got You. Grace Got You, that's the song. Uh, Grace Got You. Grace Got You, you like that song too? Anybody else? Anybody else want to say what your favorite part was? Um, when they had to go up on the stage and when they danced. Oh, yeah. Um, the song. The songs. The bugs. The bugs. <laughs> okay. So. Grace got you again. Grace got you. Yeah, we did do a song called Grace Got You. It's our anthem for the school year. So you probably hear it on the radio by Mercy Me. So if you want to do that with your kids, I'm almost going to guarantee you that they'll be rocking in the back seat. Can we do it now? Not right now. We'll do it back there. How about that? Deal? All right. So every night, what did we end a VBS with every night? Besides Grace Got You. What did we end with? Songs. And what else? What did, what did Miss Sherry do when we were up here? What did I say? Bubbles. Bubbles. Oh, that's true. Fancy, look what you did. The bubbles. <laughs> they love the bubbles. We would pray, right? We would pray at the end of every night at VBS. So we're going to do that now, okay? So can we bow our heads, close our eyes, and talk to God? Heavenly Father God, thank you for VBS this last week. Thank you for every child that came, every family. We hope we represented you well, Lord, and we hope that this will be a starting point for great relationships with you, God, and in this community, God. Thank you for the fun we had, Lord, and we hope and pray that we will be able to do it again next year, God, and that there'll be even more kids and even more volunteers, Lord. We love you so much, and everyone said, in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys. It's good to see future worship leaders up here and future members of the body that don't want to be on stage and want to serve elsewhere. Uh, it's good to see both. And it's good, I don't know if you noticed, but um, we do thank our preschool leaders, crew leaders, for wrangling children five nights in a row and, uh, and to be loving them all throughout the week. If you have a Bible, uh, open it up to, we'll be in John 10, and then we'll go to Acts 20 for a little bit, and then we'll be in 1 Peter 5. So that's kind of the order. We'll start in John 10, and then we'll get to 1 Peter 5 at the end of it. Happy Father's Day to all you men. Uh, before you leave, uh, we want to uh, give those who are 18 or older a gift. And so make sure you walk out, uh, whether you're a dad or not, with that gift. If you are a student here, uh, we will give you a gift if you linger around in fellowship for a little bit, and we have enough left over. But we have 100 uh, Uncle Bob gift cards that we want to give out to, uh, to guys today. So make sure you get one of those before you walk out. Our First Impressions team is going to be handing out the connection card booklets. So if you're a guest with us, fill that out. Fill the gray section out. Uh, last week, Pastor Eric talked about baptism. If that's the next step for you, mark that box, and we'll be in contact this week and uh, follow up with you in that way. Today, uh, we continue in our series called Together, which lasts throughout the summer, culminates in our 15-year anniversary at the end of August. The underlying thread throughout this series is this, that what does the New Testament teach us about life and ministry in the local church? How does it call us to live? How does it call us to believe? How does it call us to relate to one another as well as the, the world around us? Too often we make assumptions on what life in the church should look like 
rather than looking to Scripture as our authority, as our guide. And the idea of God's people together is throughout the New Testament. In any picture or analogy of the church that we see, together is there. It is never independent and isolated. It is always dependent and together. And if we're honest, that kind of grinds at some of us because we're Americans. In less than a month, we're going to celebrate Independence Day. And I most certainly have nothing against our nation. I love our nation. I, I, I love that day. I love to be able to celebrate. It's our nation's birth, grilled meats, fireworks. I love that day. But there's something in us, both in our self-sufficient natures that we are born with and the nurturing that we have experienced, that we go, no, we're not dependent on anything or anyone. Some of you have a family member or a friend who kind of chides you saying, well, your Christian faith is just a crutch. Like you can't stand on your own without it. And they are implying that the greatest achievement is for a man or woman to live inter or live independently self-sufficiently and isolated, that that is the pinnacle of what it means to be a man or a woman. And yet the New Testament gives us a vastly different picture. It is a picture of dependence upon the Lord and together with one another in the church, interdependence rather than independence. And the subject that we're looking at today is countercultural as well. You get that idea throughout the series, but today the title is Together We Follow. And the idea of follow implies authority that someone is leading another person or persons, and apart from the grace of God in our lives, we are born with attitudes that say, I'm going to follow myself. I'm going to call the shots. I'm going to be my own boss. I'll do what I want to do. Whether you're a parent in here, whether you work with the next generation, maybe you experienced this at VBS this week as you served, or you're around younger kids, you've interacted with children who do not naturally follow. When you say, come here, go there, start this, stop that, their first inclination is not to follow. This is not just true of a younger generation. This is in all of us, the sin nature that we're born with. And to follow, though, is the essence of what it means to trust in Christ. To follow him, it leads to salvation. It leads to life and joy. To follow him together is one way we flourish and enjoy ministry and mission together as the church think about when jesus began his earthly ministry he started uh, calling his disciples mark 1 16 through 18 records this passing along the, alongside the sea of galilee he saw simon and andrew the brother of simon casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen and jesus said to them follow me and i will make you become fishers of men and immediately they left their nets and followed him so right from the beginning, we see Simon and Andrew following the Lord together. Anyone here who is a Christ follower, we remember that day or that season when we began to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior, when we intentionally turned away from following ourselves and began to follow Him as Savior and Lord. If you haven't done that today, I pray that today would be that day. To help us better understand what it looks like for the people of God, to follow him together. He gives, us, he gives us a picture of shepherd and sheep. We see that picture described several times in the New Testament, John 10 being an example, 1 Peter 5, Acts 20. Throughout Scripture, we see about 450 verses that refer to sheep, shepherd, or shepherding. And in those pictures, we see three roles. There are the sheep, that's the Christ followers. So just like you're a part of the body, you're also a member of his flock, a sheep, the next role we see in Scripture that is that of a shepherd, Moses, Jeremiah, David, were shepherds of sheep, but also of God's people in the, the Old Testament. Israelite leaders are sometimes referred to as shepherds. In the New Testament, elders and pastors are referred to as shepherds or under-shepherds of God's people, and we're going to look at that today. And finally, the other role that is talked about in this picture of sheep and shepherding is that the Lord is the ultimate shepherd good chief shepherd psalm 103 says this acknowledge that the lord is god he made us and we are his his people the sheep of his pasture psalm 23 psalm that's uh, read a lot at funerals or maybe you memorized as a kid but it begins with the lord is my what shepherd i have what i need he lets me lie down in green pastures 
He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. In the Old Testament, the Lord promises that one day a Messiah will come as the good shepherd. It says this in Ezekiel 34, 23. I will establish over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will shepherd them. He will tend them himself and will be their shepherd. And then you get to John 10, and Jesus begins to describe more about himself as the fulfillment of that good shepherd. So what makes him good? Before we talk about sheep or elders and pastors and under shepherds, we first need to be reminded of our good shepherd because that's who we all together ultimately follow. So verses 7 through 18, Jesus is talking. He says this, verse 7, Jesus said again, Truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, since he is not the shepherd and doesn't own the sheep, leaves them and runs away when he sees a wolf coming. The wolf then snatches and scatters them. This happens because he is a hired hand and doesn't care for the sheep. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. But I have other sheep that are not from this sheep pen. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock, one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it back up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have the right to lay it down, and I have the right to take it back up again. I have received this command from my Father. So, some key takeaways here. There's one flock and one shepherd. That's verse 16. There's one way to enter the flock, and that is through Jesus as the gate. So you can't sneak in some other way. You can't go over some back wall. You've got to enter through him as the gate. He is the way and the truth and the life. Verse 9, he said, I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. So not only are we saved through Christ, but through him we find pasture, meaning we find life. We find those green, we, we find those still waters, those green pastures, whether on mountaintops or in valleys. We find the abundant life that he promises in verse 10. Jesus is the good shepherd because he is the one who laid down his life for the sheep, for the sake of people. And yet he is so good, he came back to life, took his life back up again on the third day because it was his right, meaning he has the authority. He has the authority to lay it down and take it back up again. No one, Jesus bows to no one. He is the, he is the King of kings, Lord and lords. And he laid down his life and took it back up again so that those who, through faith and by grace, could find salvation by entering through him as that gate. He's the good shepherd. And the Lord has called us, the local church, his flock, to follow him together. We are his sheep. In this comparison of being called sheep, we learn some things about us. Being referred to as a sheep is not the most flattering of terms, right? Sheep are not the brightest of animals. Sheep need to be led to food, led to pasture. Sheep are prone to wander, and when they wander, from what I've heard from farmers who actually farm and, and, and take care of sheep, when sheep wander, other sheep tend to follow. Oh, you want to go there? Oh, I, I want to go there too. Isaiah 53, 6 tells us that like sheep, we have all wandered away. We've strayed away. Sheep are not naturally those who find their way home. They need leadership. They need a guide. Sheep have no significant claws or teeth. They're pretty defenseless. No one's ever been scared of a sheep, right? You have not ooh, what are you going to do? Cuddle with me? Snuggle with me? Ooh. And all that picture reminds us that we need shepherds in our lives. We need shepherding. We need someone or someones to shepherd our hearts. If we are to follow the good shepherd, we need local shepherds of individual flocks or churches. 
See, the Lord in his goodness and wisdom didn't leave us to figure out how to follow him together on our own. Like, well, I'm the good shepherd. Good luck on following me. But he gave us a structure, a model, a pattern of how we do that as the local church that leads to the health and the flourishing of the flock as a whole and the individual sheep. And that pattern is that of godly elders who serve as under-shepherds of the good and chief shepherd, Jesus Christ. And the elders are then charged to shepherd the local flocks who have been entrusted to them. A consistent pattern in all the New Testament churches is that of of a plurality of elders. Not just dictator elder, but a group of elders. Leadership is shared. Acts 6 gives us a picture, although it's not referring to elders per se, but it gives us a picture of leadership in the New Testament being shared And as a result, if you read that chapter, as a result, the church grew and the church flourished because leaders were rising up. In the New Testament, the words of elder, pastor, overseer, shepherd, they're all interchangeable. They all refer to the same role. Now, depending on your background, when you hear church elders, you might think church boards or policymakers or financial officers, trustees, administrators, maybe just the paid pastors, of the church, but I want us to keep coming back to what does Scripture show us? Not what, not what does our experience show us or what do our assumptions show us, but what does Scripture teach us? And so who is qualified to be an elder? Well, again, we, go, we come back to the Scriptures to define those qualifications. Much like King David was anointed as the future king of Israel, he was anointed because the Lord looked at the heart looked on the inside of him, looked at, his, looked at the inner character of him. The New Testament, in, in that same way, the New Testament primarily puts its emphasis on the leadership or on the character of the leader. Do leaders have to be competent? Yes. There are skills to leadership. But the primary emphasis of the New Testament is on the character of the leader, his way of life, his heart, his heart for the Lord. The qualifications are listed in two places, 1 Timothy and Titus. And so just really quickly, I want to go through some of these. An elder must be above reproach. They can't be the guy who shames the gospel or the name of Jesus with their way of life. Their lips and their walk have to line up with their heart. A husband of but one wife. Does that mean he has to be married? No, the apostle Paul wasn't married. This does mean, though, that if, he, if, if he's married, he's faithful to his wife. He is a one-woman man is what is the definition or the meaning behind that. So if he's single, he's fleeing sexual immorality. He is, if, if by God's grace he would get married someday, he's walking in a way that honors his future wife. Temperate. He's sober-minded and alert. He's not going to be carried away by passions. He's able to think and react well. It is not, I'm going to react and then think about it later. He's self-controlled. He's not a hothead. He's got control over his tongue. He's not flippant flippant in his words or his actions. He's not blowing up at work, blowing up at the waitress, blowing up at the driver, blowing up at his TV when his sport team is not doing well. He's prudent. He's wise, discerning. He's practical. The next word is respectable. The idea that as people see his way of life and interact with him, people respect that. Hospitable. He engages the lost world around him. He understands that all that he's been given is from the Lord and he's been entrusted to manage or steward that for the Lord's purposes and not his own. So he welcomes both believer and unbeliever into his home. He is hospitable. An elder must be able to teach This means they're able to read, study, and teach Scripture, whether that be to one-on-one, small group, their own children, to a church at large, whether it be on a Sunday morning preaching or in another capacity. Not given to drunkenness. An elder can't be addicted to substances. Nothing has control over his life other than the Holy Spirit. An elder can't be violent, but needs to be gentle. A shepherd doesn't shepherd the sheep by beating the sheep. A shepherd is gentle, a calm, loving approach to his way of life. 
not quarrelsome, it talks about. This can't be a guy where his pride exists in such a way where he always has to have the opposite view. That he is the contrarian and that is who he is. He's always the devil's advocate. Guys who argue for the sake of arguing. There's no place for that in the inner workings of the elder team. It's not a group of yes men, but it's also not a, a group of men who are prone to the petty or silly arguments that Paul talks about elsewhere in the New Testament. Not a lover of money. He's generous of what the Lord has given him. So the Lord is Lord over money in his life. Next uh, thought there given in 1 Timothy and Titus. Must manage his own household well. Once again, if he can't serve his wife, his children, and lead and love at home, if he can't shepherd at home, then he cannot lead and love and shepherd in the local church. He first has to do it at home as a way of life. He can't be a recent convert. There has to be some maturity to his faith or else the idea of him being an elder is going to puff him up with pride. Or his, his understandings, his beliefs and convictions of Scripture are not going to be fully formed and then they're going to potentially deviate from the truth later on. He needs to be well thought of with outsiders. So it can't be a guy where people find out he's an elder of a church and they go, really? Huh. Really? That's surprising to me. So in their day-to-day -day lives, how they do business, how they interact with their neighbors, how they interact with their kids, their spouse. When they hear that this man is an elder, the world around would say, yeah, it makes sense. Other characteristics include that he, that he loves what is good. He's upright and just. He's disciplined. He's fleeing sexual temptation, pursuing holiness. He's not overbearing. In other words, he'll listen more than he'll talk. He holds firmly to the message of Scripture. He's, his life is being built on the truth of God's Word. He's clinging to that truth and not deviating from it. This is who an elder is, an under-shepherd. Elders are godly men who love the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Who love people as much as they love themselves. Who love this church and the people who call this church home. And love the people yet to be reached by this ministry and by this local church flock. Elders also know they're not entitled or deserving of a position in a local church. So it's not like, hey, I've been here X amount of years. I've served in this. Why aren't I an elder yet? If that's the posture, that's not an elder. That's not 1 Timothy and Titus. Rather, it is a role that says, I'm not adequate for this. And in that, it forces you to dependence and together. It forces you away from independence and isolated. So what's an elder do? We can see some examples in that picture of shepherd. Six thoughts. The first one, shepherds feed the flock. Jesus commanded Peter to feed his sheep three times over when he was restoring him to ministry following that denial. Shepherds give spiritual food to the flock primarily through the teaching and preaching of God's word on Sunday mornings, as well as equipping and encouraging the sheep to feed themselves during the week. Here's how to read Scripture. Let's read Scripture together. Let's feed from God's Word, not just on Sunday mornings, but as a way of life. Shepherds comfort and care for the flock. They bind up the injured. They comfort the broken. They care for the sick. James 5.14 talks about calling elders so that they could pray for you and pray for healing. Shepherds protect the flock. This is primarily about protecting from false teachers, false doctrine. Paul says this in Acts 20. He's giving this charge to the Ephesian elders before he leaves them. And he says this in verses 28 through 31 in Acts 20. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Men will rise up even from your own number and distort the truth to lure the disciples into following them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for three years I never stopped warning each of you with tears. 
He's not saying if false teachers will come, but when they come. Teachers who will stray from the Bible being the Word of God, they will distort the truth, they will twist its life-giving words to accommodate shifts in culture. This is one reason why, according to Titus 1.9, elders must be able to not only teach, but remain uh, sound in their doctrine, to cling to sound doctrine so that they can protect. But an elder's job is not just to uh, keep false teaching from happening. It's primarily about let's have good gospel, biblical teaching, true teaching that leads to life. Shepherds lead the flock. This is twofold. There's leadership of individual sheep. Elders must echo the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 11.1 1, where he says, follow me as I follow Christ. Or some of your translations may say, imitate. Imitate my way of life. So there's that individual aspect, but there's also elders that oversee the flock as a whole. Another word given to elders is that idea of overseer. They oversee the ministry and the mission of the church and evaluate the health of the overall flock and where it's going and what pastures next and those kind of things. Shepherds correct and restore the sheep is the next one. We were prone to wander before knowing Christ and yet we still have that propensity in our lives even after knowing him. So under shepherds, when they see a sheep straying or erring or wandering into this dangerous pasture, they call them back. Don't, don't go there. Don't go there. Come back. Come back into the fold. Come back into where life is abundant here. Don't go to that pasture that looks green, but in the end is dead. There's a warning element with the role of elders. We'll touch on that a little bit next week. But not all pastures lead to life. In John 10, he's talking about thieves, thieves and wolves. So elders help sheep from straying. And finally, the last of the six actions, shepherds find lost sheep. Luke 15 tells us the story of shepherds leaving the 99 and going to the one that was lost. The good shepherd Jesus is not just concerned with those who, have, who are already following him but those yet to be reached and those yet to be called to return to him. Godly elders lead and shepherd in a way that reflects the heart of God saying, wait, there, there's disciples to be made here, but there are also disciples to be made that do not know him yet. There are nations to be reached, neighborhoods to be reached, and so elders shepherd the flock in a way that, that resists the temptation to turn inward and remains a Christ-like passion to pursue the one as well as make disciples of the church. So then in 1 Peter 5, we're given five verses, 1 through 5, that remind us of the picture of Jesus as good shepherd, uh, under shepherds, elders, and then us as sheep or the flock of God. And in this section, elders are giving four commands that should be shaping uh, the motivations of them. And then to all believers, including elders, all the sheep in a sense, are given one command and one promise as a result of that command. This all-encompassing command and promise is the essence of what it looks like for us to follow the Lord together. This is where it begins. So let me read the five verses. I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness to the sufferings of Christ as well as one who shares in the glory about to be revealed Shepherd God's flock among you, not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly, as God would have it, or have you. Not out of greed for money, but eagerly, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. In the same way, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Shepherd God's flock among you. So he gives four don'ts and do's, if you will, exposing the motivations of leadership. The first one is this, verse 2. Don't serve out of compulsion, but do so, but do serve willingly. No one should be a leader in a church because they were forced into it, pressured into it, out of obligation. The, in the book of Acts, you repeatedly see that the Holy Spirit 
is the one who sets apart leaders for service in that way. Acts 13 being an example of that. So for those in an elder shepherd role, there has to be the sense of calling that you know that the, that the Lord is moving you in this direction. And that sense of calling must then line up with the qualifications talked about in 1 Timothy and Titus. There are two ways to approach how we serve in ministry. It's a job, obligation, requirement, or it's a calling. A God-given opportunity to serve Jesus and glorify the Lord. You can see it as clock in, clock out, check it off the list, what's the next, what's the next thing to do? Or you can see it as a calling that you're living out. Jesus called the clock in, clock out people to hired hands in John 10. And it's not a pretty picture. The hired hands, when they see the wolf coming, they abandon the sheep and run away. The wolf then comes in and attacks, he says, and the hired hand had disappeared because the hired hand doesn't really care for the sheep. Only saw it as a job. Only saw it as check in, check out. Shepherds don't serve because they have to. They serve because they want to. It's a willingly. Second motivation from verse 2. And don't serve because you're greedy for money, but do serve eagerly. Shepherds love God and love people and use money to demonstrate and show that love. They do not love money and then use God's people to somehow manipulate or get more money. Elders do not see the people of God as pawns to manipulate in ministry. Elders are aware of the truth in 1 Timothy 6.10, which says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So elders, specifically those in a paid position, aren't in it for the money. They love the Lord and use money to express and show that love to people, and they reject the idol of money, the love of money, because they know the truth of 1 Timothy 6.10 is not just for the sheep. It's for the shepherd. And that the love of money can lead to a piercing of many griefs. Third motivation spoken of in verse 3. Don't serve because you want to lord your authority over people, but do serve among the flock as an example. Some leaders are motivated by the title or by the position. You might have seen that at work. You might have seen that at church or somewhere else. They have the title behind their name, and they're going to make sure you know about it. They want to be in authority, but not under authority. Far too often, especially lately in our culture, we see story after story after story of leaders in the church who have placed themselves out from underneath the authority. They are a man unto themselves, and it's leading to the destruction of lives and a terrible testimony to the watching world. Domineering leadership is not reflective of the New Testament teaching on elders. It also doesn't lead to a healthy church body. The pride in us naturally wants to be in charge, to call the shots, to have authority. Or we want to be in power because we have some personal agenda or some faction we represent or some issue that we just really want to shove through. That's not loving the flock. That's not being a godly example. When leaders cease to follow, they cease to lead in the way of Christ. Leaders must be followers first. If we lead or serve because we want the power or the title, we won't be willing to be corrected. We won't be willing to be called out for something or told, I, I see this in your life. See, the elder team, we are among one another, giving, receiving, speaking the truth in love, iron sharpening iron. Proverbs twenty-seven seventeen. If you're out from underneath authority, if all you want to do is be in authority, then you never want your iron sharpened. You only want to go around with your flint and start sharpening other people. Elders must be able to patiently build consensus, listen to one another, handle disagreement, forgive, receive rebuke and correction, confess sin, value the wisdom and the plurality of wisdom that Proverbs talks about. They must be able to, to submit to one another, speak kindly and gently to one another, be patient with their fellow elders and the flock that they've been entrusted to. Are the elders in a place of God-given authority in the local church and oversight in the church? Yes. Are they the ones who lead the church? Yes. Should that role of leadership go to their heads and their ego? Not at all. 
It should actually drive a sense of dependence and together, a sense of humility. The elders are not just in authority, but also under authority. They should be learning and growing and being changed by God's spirit and by God's word as much as anybody else in the church. So the elders don't lead the church in a lording way, but in a follow me as I follow Christ. Because listen, you can't be an example from on high. A leader can't be an example from on high. A leader has to be an example as they are among the church. The last motivation, verse 4. Don't serve for the applause or praise of people, but do serve for the praise of the chief shepherd. One day Jesus will return. And among other things, he will reward with glory every believer who has served him faithfully. We live and serve for an audience of one. As much as a godly man doesn't aspire to the role of elder to gain authority, they also don't do it to gain popularity. Because what you'll find is that it's not always very popular. In the end, under shepherds want the good and the chief shepherd to be praised and glorified. And then finally, in verse 5, a command is given to all and a promise is made to all. He says this, in the same way, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So the command is, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. The promise is, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Do you know what will destroy the flock? Do you know what will destroy the flock from within? You might have even seen it elsewhere. It's pride. Whether in the under, whether in the under shepherds of the sheep or in the sheep or in both, personal pride is the great enemy to us being able to follow the Lord together. Humility is the foundation, the character, the clothing that we must put on if we're going to follow him in a way that glorifies the Lord. Under shepherds, whether current or in the future, clothe yourselves with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. If we allow pride to creep in, we will most certainly fall prey to the ungodly motivations of leadership that Peter speaks of. Obligation, guilt, greedy for money, lording authority, popularity, and people-pleasing. Choosing humility leads to joyful, willing, generous, example-setting, living for the praise of one type of leadership. Sheep, the flock of God, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Listen to Hebrews 13, 7 through 9, and then verse 17. Remember your leaders who have spoken God's word to you. As you carefully observe the outcome of their lives, imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Don't be led astray by various kinds of strange teachings. And then verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, since they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account, so that they can do this with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you notice it says not unprofitable to the elder it says unprofitable to you personal pride will lead to a spirit that says i don't need a shepherd i don't need someone to care for my soul i can watch over my own way of life i'm doing just fine i don't need shepherded and it will lead to independent and isolated and that place is a dangerous, destructive place to be. When a defenseless sheep that the most it can threaten is to snuggle begins to wander, that's dangerous. 11 years of ministry, I'll tell you, that's dangerous. It's unprofitable for you. Pride in the sheep brings grief to the under-shepherds. After 11 years of ministry, I'll tell you that straight up. I will also tell you after 11 years of ministry in this role, humility in the sheep brings great joy. Great joy. To all of us, both under shepherds and sheep, where there is pride lurking in our hearts, may we repent today, not tomorrow. 
May we instead clothe ourselves daily in the humility of Christ. Listen to Peter's words recorded earlier in the same book in chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, reminding us of our good shepherd again. He says this, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that, having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but you have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. We've died to the sin of pride, Crosspoint. Christ followers, we've died to the sin of pride. That is our old creation. It has been nailed to a cross. It has been buried in a tomb. And we, those of us who confess Christ as Lord and Savior, have been raised to a new way of life. You are a new creation in Christ. And pride has no place in a new creation life. Now we live for our good shepherd who showed us what humility was all about, who sought us out as lost sheep, who laid down his life so that we might enter his flock and find abundant life in his pasture. We're going to give our offering now. We're not going to close in singing, but we are going to close in worship through giving and uh, reading scripture here in a minute. But one way we follow the Lord together is we give together. So while we give individually, I want, I want you to continually be reminded on Sundays as an opportunity for us to give corporately together as the family of God, as the flock of God. And so I want to pray for that as First Impressions passes the baskets. Father God, I pray that you would be at work in our giving, reminding us that you are, are who we worship that we as your people, we confess that we are prone to love money more than you. And so as we give, we are tangibly attacking that temptation and saying, no, Lord, we, we love you more than money. And so we want to use the money that you've entrusted, with, uh, entrusted to us to demonstrate that love to you. So teach us to trust, teach us to love, and may you be glorified in it. In Jesus' name, amen. So like I said at the beginning, uh, all guys ages 18 or older, we have a gift for you. Uh, whether you're a dad yet or not, um, if you're a student, hang out long enough and you might grab a card. But we have uh, one scoop gift cards from Uncle Bob's. On Mother's Day, we gave away Mika's gift cards to the ladies. Today, we're giving away a similar gift with some strings attached, okay, with Mika's cards. It was, you need to go with other ladies or with your daughters or with other people to enjoy that Mika's moment, if you will. Same way with the ice cream. Men, you can't eat this ice cream alone, although it is always tempting to eat ice cream alone. Um, I, I just guess I confess that right there. Um, so uh, you can't come home from work and like grab yourself a scoop of cookie dough and eat it in your car before you come home. If that's going to help your attitude, you can do that another time. And uh, then you, but I, but I also want you to take these cards as you walk out and either take your kids if you have them, you can give them the one card or the one scoop card and you get your three scoop, you order yourself up, whatever you want, okay? Um, or you go with other guys around here that you don't know very well yet or maybe your community group or maybe a guy that you're trying to reach. Through the years, he doesn't attend here, but I've got a brother in Christ that we've had some great conversations over milkshakes, all right? So I'm just... We're trying to equip you and encourage you to not just see this as a gift, but see this as a tool or a gift to be used in that way to, to form community. All right? Um, I want to pray for you men, and then we're going to stand afterwards and read Psalm 100 together. Uh, Father God, I pray for the men that call this church home, whether they are in, uh, no matter their age, whether they are dads yet or not, whether they are a student, whether they are a grandfather. I pray for the men who call this church home that you would give us an overwhelming conviction to clothe ourselves with humility, to reject proud living. Teach us to return to you as the shepherd and overseer of our souls. Give us a heart that desires to be shepherded the desires to be led. Teach us to trust in you as our good shepherd. 
And we pray by faith that through our way of life, that those who follow us, whether it be our peers, generations before us, generations after us, would see through our words and our way of life that you are our good shepherd and that to follow you is what leads to life. So give us opportunities, whether it be over ice cream or some other time this week. Give us opportunities to share our faith and talk about things that matter. We know that you're able. We know that you're willing. Thank you for being our perfect Father to us. Comfort those today who grieve because of a loss of a father. Be present with them as their good shepherd. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's stand up and Psalm 100. I want us to read this together as we close in worship. All right? Let the whole earth Shout triumphantly to God. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are His. His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and bless His name. For the Lord is good and His faithful love endures forever. His faithfulness through all generations. See you back next week. God bless.